Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the pruning chapter in uh, HOR 160 Landscape Management. And so pruning is a subject very dear to my heart. It was something that I learned uh, very early on in my career. When I say career, I'm talking about as a young boy uh, growing up in a horticulture business. Um, me and my brother, we did a lot of mowing with my father in the crews out there, especially when it came to push mowing, we would be taken to large properties, um, you know, in excess of a hundred acres of, you know, communities that we mowed. And we would push mow uh, every single day during the, the summertime. And then when we would finish mowing, we would be with either my mom and my aunt or both of them together uh, on a pruning crew. And so I really learned how to prune by hand the correct way uh, by two really important women in my life, my mother and my, my aunt, so mom's sister. So uh, Sylvia Jones and Carol Morrill, uh, you uh, are the ones that taught this uh, horticulture professional how to prune and I'm very proud to say that so let's go ahead and get started with pruning we're going to look at our introduction and pruning is the most frequently misunderstood but critical function in directing the development of plants to fulfill the intent of the landscape designer now think about that we're, we're supposed to maintain these shapes that the the designer or the architect wants the plants to have we need to keep them looking like their natural characteristics. And when you grab a pair of hedge clippers and you do this to the very bottom of something like this foundation planting, very improper pruning. There is nothing good about this picture right here. Nothing, nothing. And it really drives me crazy seeing seeing this but proper pruning techniques require time and understanding of the plant's habitat biology and function of the design it's just like with having a pesticide application go wrong the number one reason we have a pesticide failure is that we don't correctly identify the pest that we are targeting and so how in the world can we prune correctly these plants if one we don't know how to identify them and two if we don't understand their biology, you have to know that about your plants. That's why plant materials are so important, recognizing them, knowing what they are, and then state, studying plant science and how these plants grow. You got to learn these things. But I am very, very disappointed in a lot of the pruning that I see going on all over town this time of year people are just butchering plants and it really really bothers me and so why prune the primary reason for pruning is to maintain the size and natural form of landscape plants we want to maintain the natural and seriously when you go and you prune a plant by hand correctly it should look like you've never been there all you've done is reduce a little bit of the size it should still look the way it should look. It's kind of like going to get a haircut, right? You know, women go and get their hair done and everything and, and make it look pretty. But the idea is to kind of make it look the same, right? Now, when I go get a haircut, I, I get a lot cut off. So you're going to see it cut off. But that's, you know, I get a haircut with actually hedge clippers, right? You know, because they buzz it off on the sides. But when you go and you get a, you know, trimmed with scissors, the idea is to, to maintain the original look and you just reduce a little bit of growth. Pruning also maintains the health of landscape plants by removing dead, diseased, rubbing, or damaged branches. You know, and a lot of times, if you're just doing that, if you're removing some of the bad wood, you're not going to do, you're not going to need to do anything else. You're not needing to butcher it. You're not needing to pollard it or cut it back, the crepe murder. Now, a lot of people get real confused and upset about the crepe murdering that's going on. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a hit or miss. You can correctly prune a crepe myrtle just like you can any other shrub. Instead of butchering them back, thin them out, reduce some of the height, 
reduce some of the dead. Every crepe myrtle you walk up on is going to have branches rubbing. I mean, that's, that's just a given fact. They're going to rub and it's going to create a point where disease and insects can get into the tree. Cut that out. You're not going to have to pollard uh, like they do, or they call it crepe murdering. The true definition or the true name of cutting back crepe myrtles is pollarding. And our ancestors used to do it a long time ago. They pollarded for different reasons than we do today. They pollarded their trees because they needed sunlight in the winter to filter through and help heat the house. And when you pollard a tree in the spring, you're going to have that flush of growth that actually helped them shade the house in the, in the hotter temperatures of the summer. And then when they pollard it again in the, in the wintertime, all that new growth gave them extra firewood to burn in the stove. So totally different reason for pollarding. Uh, and that's a history lesson. Pruning is used to train young trees to their proper form or future development. So yes, you got to start early. You can train that plant on how to grow basically by just pruning it. You want to have one central leader. So if you've got two or three that could possibly be in there, you need to select one, leave it, and cut the other ones out. Pruning spent flowers or fruit encourages development of flowers and fruits for the next season. Also encourages flowers on plants which bloom on their current season's growth. People are cutting azaleas this time of year. <laughs> why, oh, why are they cutting Azaleas, they're getting ready to bloom. And I've seen so many individuals get off the hedge clippers and butcher azaleas. And then the client's going to be like, why are my azaleas blooming? Well, your landscaper did not know the correct time of year to prune azaleas. You prune azaleas right after they bloom. And like I said, that encourages development of flowers for the next season. Don't cut off the buds that are getting ready to open up, but people do it so many times, so many times, too often. We prune for safety. We want to uncover windows. We want to be able to see out. We have to prune trees that are growing underneath power lines. And I don't understand why in the world we plant trees underneath power lines to begin with, but we do. We got to cut them back for lighting. It's blocking lighting. Again, that's a security issue. Exit driveways. You can't see backing out of someone's driveway if the plants are too tall. But again, that goes back to the designer not knowing their plant materials either. And then you got the structure damage. Trees planted too close to the house. You got uh, roots growing underneath it, uplifting sidewalks, uplifting foundations. So they need to be pruned back. They need to be cut down and removed if it's causing structure damage. We also prune to maintain plants in unnatural shapes. Now, this is the one of the few times that I say it's okay to use hedge clippers because I really like this. I love the, the formal gardens, and I love walking through and seeing this. Now, unfortunately, you can see some different colors in these. Well, it's probably either boxwoods or a type of holly here. I can't really see. I'd have to get up on the plant and actually see it. But you can see there's starting to be some dead in those. And that's that's always going to happen. It's always going to happen. But I, I like the topiary as well. And I do like the formal uh, garden. So it's, it's okay to do that every now and then. Pruning is used to renovate old overgrown plants and restore them to their proper landscape function and size. Now, yes, a lot of the times you may have a client call you and say, I want to um, do a landscape rejuvenation or a renovation of my front foundation plant. Okay, we can do that. And you step back and you look, and, you know, these are some really nice plants. All they need to do is be cut back hard one time and they're gonna come back outstanding. We used to do that with compacta hollies uh, all the time. They'd get overgrown, they'd be planted in like a circle or whatever, and so many, People had been hedge clipping them and shearing them back that if we went in and cut them hard, they're going to come back awesome. They're going to come back fresh and they're going to have that new burst of growth and they look really neat. You can also do that with Burford hollies. 
so many plants that get butchered like that with hedge clippers every so often, every three, four, five, six years, maybe go in there and just cut them back. These hollies will respond well, but you can look here. You got year one, remove one third of the oldest branches from the base. Year two, after pruning, uh, light and air can reach the center of the plant. And then year two and three, remove another third of the old wood on each of the following years. Then year three, all the old wood has been removed to make room for the vigorous new growth. Very good slide right there. Very good slide. Pruning trees can reduce shade and wind resistant. Now, if you're looking at this slide right here, this is the perfect way to do it. I call it thinning it out. You know, most people see a tree like that and they're just gonna, you know, cut it back to knobs, cut it all one shape, all one size, go in and thin it out. So you can see the before and after right there. And that's gonna allow wind to pass through it. It's going to allow some more sunlight to come through. But you know, on these hot days, plants can be used in um, having a house, the home's heating and cooling bill. I mean, we really can, we can really help with that. Allowing the sunlight to come through in the winter warms up the house. You know, we reduce the sunlight hitting the house with shade, uh, with shade trees. That's going to help our cooling bill. Pruning can compensate for root loss at planting. So continuing the debate over the research uh, proves otherwise. Here we have an increase in root shoot ratio with active new growth. So uh, again, it's probably going to be something that's talked about um, for lo long after I'm gone. Same thing with, you know, removing the wire baskets and, and whether we should bag grass or not. It's just one of those things that we'll always debate uh, in the green industry. So developing and Developing a scheduling pruning program. Pruning is an intricate part of landscape management and should not interfere with other duties. Problems occur when pruning is delayed for other activities or when the landscape supervisor has crews prune just to keep them busy. Voila, get out the hedge clippers and let's go to town on these plants. Don't just do it because you don't have anything else to do. And then don't, do not skip pruning your azaleas because you're doing something else right after they bloom. You need to know what's going on with your plants and you need to know the correct time. That's why in a landscape management plan, you should know when these individuals bloom and that's the time you prune them. So you're gonna have to take a site inventory. You're gonna have to see how many deciduous evergreen trees that you have. If you got any roses, vines, flowering trees, larger shade trees, pine or large conifers, ground covers. Now look at this right here. This is a, you know, commercial property and this is doing a veg vegetation study, but you would need to do that for your customers. You need to know what's on there. List it. You've already done that for your landscape management plan. You've already told me the plant materials that you have on there. Next thing we've got to do is we've got to figure out when these plants bloom and when is the proper time to actually prune them. You don't prune a property once or twice a year. You're there pruning multiple times a year because you're going back just to prune what needs to be pruned. You're not going to prune azaleas this time of year because you're pruning hollies that have some new growth on it. You're not going to do it. You're going to go back and you'll prune your azaleas a little bit later after they bloom. Personnel, ways to handle pruning, specialized crews to prune all the company sites. I agree wholeheartedly. And if you love pruning, you can make a lot of money. You could just prune not only for residential clients, but you could prune for other landscape companies that hate doing it. My gosh, I would love it. Put on my, put in my iP uh, iPods, play some good music, use hand pruners. Have a gallon of water there. Beautiful day like it is outside right now. I'd be more happier doing that than I am recording lectures. But I want to teach people how to prune correctly. You'd be able to charge, you know, 80 to 100 bucks an hour easily hand pruning, hand pruning. Not everybody's going to hire you, but the ones that do are the ones that understand that this needs to be done and you'd be able to do it. 
You can have one or more members of a general crew pruning their sites only. I still like that. Number one, specialized crews. You have a pruning crew and then everyone prunes everything, or you can do contract pruning. And that's what I'm talking about. You could be the ones that other landscapers contract with to prune their properties. Now, here's the thing. You may not have enough, enough, enough personnel to do it when uh, it needs to be done. So you've got to start planning this stuff. You've got to have it in a software program that's going to help you do that. When do those individuals shrubs need pruning? You may have a million azaleas that you have to prune because you're working for, you know, 7,000 clients. You know, this happens with a lot of the larger companies uh, across, you know, North Carolina. You can't have that one specialized crew. You may have to go in and let, you know, some of your other crew members uh, go in and prune that particular plant, that particular time of year. Now with your hollies and stuff, you'd be able to wait and not have it um, on such a detailed schedule, but these plants that bloom that have to be pruned right after their bloom time so that they'll bloom next year, you've got to have the personnel to knock it out. The personnel must be able to identify the plant material. Hey, go prune the azaleas and they come back and there's all a bunch of Nellie Stevens clippings on the truck and you're like, oh my gosh, what's happened? So they need to know their plant materials. They must have an interest in pruning and respect for the plants. They must properly train or have horticultural experience. And then the specialized personnel can prune more efficiently and profitable. Make sure they know their plant materials. Scheduling, common to use uh, calendar schedules. But the, remember, the weather can modify bloom dates and growth flushes. We've seen that with the cherries this year. It's been it's been a weird year for cherries. They're a little bit late. Schedule specific times for pruning according to the current year growth pattern and schedule to meet the needs as many of the plants on site as possible to minimize trips and simplify cleanup. Pruning for painting, storms, or construction are not included in your contracts. So if mother nature comes in and takes a big chunk of the tree out or whatever, that's not your problem. You've got to charge for that, for that, uh, for that visit. Brush and debris handling. This is the final aspect of pruning. Is it taken to the landfill? Is it recycled? Are you using chippers? Now here at this plant, um, you know, they've been used by not mechanical gas powered shears. They're actually being used by the uh, um, hand, hand motorized or hand power uh, shears. And they've gone in and done a topiary shrub like that. Good way to do that is to pull out the tarp and let the clippings fall on it. A lot of people, I hate doing this. You see people do it all the time, but they'll pull the pine straw or the mulch back and let the clippings fall on the ground and then rake the pine straw and mulch back over it. Not a good way to do it. You don't want to do it that way. And then uh, there's always going to be a mess like that. But when you hand prune stuff, there's no clippings. You, you cut the clipping and then you throw it on the canvas. So you're not having to handle it once or twice. Like when this stuff gets thrown all over the way and you're going to rake it and then you're going to leave some debris in the shrubs and clients are going to call you back and say, hey, my tree's got some dead clippings in it or my tree's dying because all they see is those brown spots and you go back and you have to take the rake and rake out the debris again it's it's just a nasty thing as you can see i hate i hate hedge clippers but the standards there is the international society of arboriculture the pruning guidelines and then the american national standards institute ANSI a300 for pruning but you know look into becoming a certified arborist that is a very good a designation to have on your resume. I mean, it really is. I know a lot of certified arborists and they get paid a lot just to consult when it comes to um, being an arborist. And then the, the American National Standards Institute. So timing, appropriate pruning. Timing depends on the plant species, the condition and the, the desired results. Prune plants that flower early in the spring from buds formed during the past season, one-year-old wood at the end of their blooming period, like the azaleas. Prune trees and shrubs that flower during the summer or fall during the dormant season just before growth begins. And then prune needle leaf evergreens during the dormant season anytime the wood is not frozen. Prune broadleaf evergreens prized for their flowers just after blooming 
and avoid pruning in late summer where winter damage can be significant. Now, what this is meaning is when you prune a plant, it's going to generate some growth right away, especially if it's still warm. And so you go in and you cut back some of these plants, it's going to think, ah, it's time to grow, but it's the fall of the year or it's late summer. We could get some frost and cold weather real early that year and they get that flush of new growth and then we've got a hard you know hard freeze or whatever it can kill the plant pruning woods on trees will close uh, uh will close more rapidly if the cuts are made shortly before or just after growth begins it means they'll close up and protect themselves some trees known as bleeders lose considerable amounts of sap if pruned in the early spring this is not harmful, but may be an undesirable situation that the client does not like. And especially if it's dripping on their cars, if it's dripping on their sidewalks, other plant materials, it can get real nasty at times. And so with our equipment, here we have, you know, bypass and anvil pruners. My favorite is the bypass, uh, the Corona brand. Uh, unfortunately, it's named after, you know, it's not named after the coronavirus, but uh, uh, I always put you know, Corona with two things, you know, a cold beer and a good set of hand pruners. And now we've got this third thing of Corona, which is a disease that is not good. So um, I wonder if they'll want to change their names. Hopefully not, because when I, when I still hear the word Corona, I'm thinking a good set of bypass pruners. Now they also make the anvil pruners, um, but they're just, I don't know. I've just, I grew up with the, uh, the bypass and I just like that heavy spring on them that, uh, you know, you can, you can go to town, uh, with pruning with these anvil. I'd probably use more on something like herbaceous, maybe cutting back, uh, deadheading flowers or whatever, but your bypass is what you want to use like on your hollies and stuff like that to get in. But you got the draw cut bypass or scissor action. And then the anvil is called a snap cut got some loppers now they remove limbs up to one inch um, some with larger cutting heads can remove up to two to two and a half inches uh, but again you know corona brand is a good brand of pruners you got your pole pruners they remove limbs from one to two and a half inches they have a curved saw they also have this uh, like rope ratchet right here, which will open a blade and cut, or you can use the actual saw part of it. Pole pruners, you know, 10 or 12 inch chainsaw, 20 feet off the ground. Nice echo brand here. These things come in handy, uh, but you need, you need to have a lot of pruning going on before you have one of these on the truck. This is, might be something you just have one of in the shop. Pruning saws used for two inch diameter or larger. A nice little hand pruner there, that razor sawtooth. Be careful because that will take a finger off. Then you've got a cut on the draw or pull stroke like carpenter saws. Uh, so any of these work really well uh, with pruning some limbs out of trees. Head shears, I don't even keep them on the truck, guys. Get rid of them. You got gas powered or electric units, and then you got the handheld units. As we seen that individual pruning that topiary shove that had uh, that had the canvas laid out beneath it, they used a pair of the handheld units. Uh, shearing, you know, deciduous or evergreens are most frequently pruned for size control. The shearing results in exceptional growth of branch side shoots, thickening of the interior of the plant to the point where there are no leaves, branch die back, and thinning of the base plant uh, of the plant. Done when price and time is a constraint on the budget. I hate hearing that. People don't have enough money to properly take care of their plants. Well, they had money to buy them. They should have had it in the budget to take care of them. Now, granted, you know, outside of Wake Forest University, my father planted the row of Nellie Stevens behind the main entrance, you know, so you got the nice brick columns uh, and then there's those Nellie Stevens behind it. Well, what they done is they took a backhoe in there and they dug a trench and they planted these Nellie Stevens root ball to root ball. And so all of a sudden it created this green wall of mass uh, going into the front entrance. Those need to be sheared because it would take forever and a day to go and prune those by hand. So they come in there with a bucket truck and power shears and they cut that 100% okay. I understand that situation. And I understand that if you're in a large mall or shopping center and there's 
2000 Dorf Burfords on the property, you're probably going to shear them. That's when time and budget is a constraint. You've got to get it done. There's those, those things, you know, if your customer wants to create myrtles cut back, you're going to do it, even though it's called crate murdering because you want to get paid and you want to keep your customer happy. So there are times that it's going to happen. I'd much rather go in and thin out a shrub. Large growing deciduous shrubs require regular severe pruning to keep them attractive and reasonably contained. So you can see here in the diagram, just going in and thinning it out and not reducing any of the height and the shrub looks 10 times better. Shrubs with colorful canes, such as red and yellow twig dogwoods are best thinned annually after the shrub is three to five years old. You wanna go in and cut it back, thin it out. And it's gonna make them look a whole lot better. Remedial, sometimes we may take over a property that just needs severely pruned. And I can tell by this, this is a holly. They've cut it back. It almost, hope it's not. Hope it's not a foster holly, but um, you you could actually do this to a dwarf Burford holly easily. And next year, it's it's going to be green. The whole thing will be green. It'll look good. Then we have hedges. During establishment, there is no pruning except heading back the plants. At planting, head is cut shoots of broadleaf plants to within four to six inches of their planting height. Head back new shoots half to two thirds of their length each time they grow six to 12 inches until they reach the desired height. If overgrown, cut back half of the existing height in width. And so here you can see in this diagram, they've got pruned to this line and they've got the correct shape. So you've kind of got, it tapers down to the bottom. It's wider at the bottom than it is at the top. And that allows light to hit the sides and the inside of that plant. And then you've got the incorrect shape here, which is not, not good. All right, when pruning trees, traditional recommendations call for removal of a fourth to a third of the branches and thus potential leaf area. If bare root and bald and burlap woody plants at planting, I disagree with, I do. You don't need to do this. Um, and I, I know why they're doing it. I mean, it's at, you know, they're planting it. And so they're going in and they're removing some. So it's going to reduce, you know, evapotranspiration and stuff like that. So yes, there can be some possibilities of, of doing that and some, and some good points, but I don't, I don't think we have to do it so much. Um, you know, make sure you got irrigation, make sure you're checking on the trees and they should be just fine. But, um, uh, maybe removing some of the small ones is a good idea, but, you know, going back and cutting a bunch of them out. I know a lot of people that, I mean, they cut back, you know, they're cutting back more than a fourth, more than a third, they're cutting back half to, to three quarters. And so that's, that's the, you know, people read, or they see something that you've got to do that and they butcher it when they plant it. So I'd much rather see them leave it alone instead of cutting too much out. Um, when training the trees, prune routinely the first 10 years of life uh, to avoid severe pruning when older. So yes, get it started. Let the plant get used to it. X current is a central leader growth, either like on a uh, pin oak or a shamardi oak. D current is multiple leader growth, like on a maple or ash. So you'll be able to see the difference in that. Removing limbs. Do not practice flush cutting. You want to, you want to leave that collar. You want to be able to, to leave that on there and let it protect. Um, if you flush cut it, you're going to rip that bark off and there's going to be all kinds of decay and insect growth and everything inside of that, um, that armpit, as I like to call it, where you actually cut uh, your branches. So do, do not reduce the decay or speed closure, no value in preventing insect or disease infestations. And that's with like the, the wound dressing. So um, let the tree heal on its own. Topping, topping is the indiscriminate cutting of major limbs to stubs without regard to their location. Now, granted this tree right here on the left by the stop sign, it doesn't need to be there. It's too big in the first place. 
So don't plant these trees there and you're not going to have to worry about it. These all look like willow oaks. And for some reason, people love butchering the willow oaks. I, I just, I don't get it. I do not get it. Um, but anyway, just don't plant the trees where you have to do this. A lot of times it's happening underneath power lines. It's happening, you know, uh, you know, to, to allow street lights in. The trees are just too big for the area. Pilarding, you know, here is at uh, Renolda Gardens. Uh, and it is the history lesson that I was talking to. So there's your before and there's your after. They use those limbs for firewood. Um, it allows light to come in and uh, warm up the house during the wintertime, and it provides a lot of shade uh, during the summertime and helps with the cooling effect. So it's, it's a history lesson. Uh, Fastigate. Um, get a little tongue tied there, but then columnar and upright forms or fastigiat. That's how I, there I said it right. I knew it would come back to me, but branches turn sharply upward and they grow parallel with little or no horizontal development. They seldom need pruning and if pruned direct inward rather than outward. Um, so, you know, they're wanting to be shaped to a columnar tree like that. Perfect for interior courtyards like that. And so you'll see, um, some Zelkova is done like that way. Um, there is another tree that's on our plant list for plant materials I can't think of right now. Uh, but really cool uh, when done correctly. And, you know, the type of gardens that they're in, it really looks, really looks nice. Here we have weeping trees. This is a decumbent weeping forms. You know, they're coming over here. You got the nice cherry. These, these individuals are getting ready to bust wide open this time of year for, uh, for uh, their bloom color. Large conifers um, do not prune in this area. You know, look at that. The area to prune in is in that middle right there. So you're not wanting to prune, you know, below, below that on this pine tree. So you get the terminal bud, lateral buds, the needle school and then undeveloped vascular bud. So that is the area that you would prune. Wound closure and treatment. You got the cot it or the cot compartmentalization of decay in trees. Uh, you've got your bark penetrating injury contained with a two-step process and the accumulation of antimicrobial substances. They produce physical barriers to decay. And then you got four physical barriers. You got the vertical barrier keeps decay movement up and down. Annual growth ring compartmentalizes inward movement. And then the ray cells hold the decay in check and the wound wood over the wound. So uh, the tree is actually going to protect itself. It's going to, to contain itself and not allow anything in. So anyway, Guys, that wraps up chapter eight out of professional landscape management uh, pruning. Thanks, and I will see you in the next lecture.